participation and really so impressed with the uh, the mission and the ethos and and uh, ironically really fits very well with my you know uh, discussion about not only personalized medicine health and wellness but also you know Mediterranean diet and lifestyle and the things that make you know these uh, sacred organizations and communities so important for health and as Lynn said you know I'd be happy to answer any questions about anything that I speak about, but also other things that may be of, of interest. Uh, I have been for over a year, been studying and treating and researching COVID and testing antibodies. You know, we were one of the first groups to do antibodies and T cell tests and looking at patients who have vaccines or don't have vaccines, looking at antibodies, looking at side effects, looking at treatments. So I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions if people have in, in that realm as well. So as then was saying, you know, a lot of my uh, interest was for my biography as a first generation Greek, had one foot in the traditional world, one foot in the Greek world. I was really moved by the health of my grandparents, but then saw as they came to this country, uh, they and my parents were not as healthy. So my parents got ill and I always wondered what part of it was being in the rough and tumble of, of the fast pace of being in New Jersey, being in America and the stress. So even though I was a physician, I was always interested in, uh, you know, more in the why, not just the what, and being a former athlete and interested in uh, history of medicine and interested in Hippocrates, but also in the ancient Greek gymnasium and the wisdom. Uh, I was intrigued that the Greek healing god Asclepius was the origin of the first temple and that you'd go someplace for a healing space. So I got involved in talking to some doctors who were doing research on integrative medicine 20 some years ago when I started. And I was impressed that the research really married very well with what my patients were seeing. And one of my important concepts is uh, listening to the citizen scientist. And I think many patients, uh, I, I think aren't listened to enough, unfortunately. So I became, you know, went from a medical student to a student of medicine. <laughs> and then became an internist or a general practitioner, which I've been practicing for 20 years. So I do give medicines and I do know the latest in research and was in, in the academic world, but also have a, a foothold in the kind of health and wellness world in lifestyle medicine. So I try to marry both of those. And I'm proud to be one of the few doctors who's doing that in the area. And I think there's important importance for both. Uh, but one of the things I saw in my journey was that a lot of men and women would spend their health in this area acquiring wealth. You know, a lot of successful people, and then later in life would have to use their wealth to acquire health. So to me, that was very, very daunting and seeing people succeed and work, but having uh, broken health or broken relationships and then trying to re re reclaim that, which was difficult. I think an important concept is to know that disease care does not equal health care. I remember first time meeting a number of patients who told me they were healthy because they were seeing these prominent doctors who were taking care of people like Tim Russert and Vice President Cheney and President Clinton. And I said, you know, they're smart guys, but they're only interested in diseases. And I think you don't have any vitality and there's some other things missing. So they thought the, uh, the absence of illness equaled health. And, and to me, that wasn't the case. Uh, and there's a lot of different terms that are used for integrative medicine. You know, you may hear the term uh, functional medicine, integrated medicine, I call it personalized medicine, uh, but they're all under the same umbrella. And although the names are confusing they, confusing, they share certain characteristics that I think are important that you all should think about when you're engaging with your physicians or healthcare personnel. Uh, so the tenants that I think are important are one, it should be patient-centered, right? Mm -hmm. The care of the patient is patient care too much of this is not patient-centered. It's doing other things and not involved with what the patient needs. We should be on top of the pyramid. It also should be personalized. I'm a very much a fan of biochemical individuality. Each person is unique. And to think that one size fits all is really, I think, inconsistent with you know, really good care. Also, we should understand the importance of web-like interactions. You know, the whole is greater than the part. I was taught you have the heart system here, you have the brain here, you have the lungs here. And modern medicine is not appreciated as like interconnectedness. For example, you know, the gut as the second brain, right? 
the fact that we know the microbiome in the gut impacts the immune system uh, for the mental health and neurology. I tell my colleagues in those worlds that the brain is connected to the body. So if there's inflammation in the body, it's gonna affect the brain. New research has shown, or we've known that inflammation in the body, which you can measure, and we'll talk about that, impacts mood, impacts the cardiac system. So these things are really interconnected. I had a woman who had chronic inflammation and was probably contributing to her osteoporosis. And she, was just, given, like she yeah. was just given more calcium, for example, and not looked at other factors. I think that's important. Also, as Lynn mentioned, high tech and high touch, right? The person, it's more important to know the person who has the illness than the illness the person has. And then looking at the root cause, you know, what is the why, not just the what? So root cause. If someone has, for example, I think a lot of patients who have mild cognitive decline, you know, there's a lot of research on it that many things can cause cognitive decline. Insulin resistance and prediabetes, they're calling dementia type three diabetes, right? So is that a culprit? Is it because they're deficient in omega-3? Is it because they have heart disease or genetic tendency? Not one size fits all. And also thinking of health as positive, as positive vitality, not the absence of disease. You know, is this person vital? You know, do they have vitality? And it's one of the questions I ask in my questionnaire, you know, do you have vitality? Has that changed over the years? And then looking at the citizen scientists, I've learned so much over my 20 plus years of talking to patients. You know, what's, what's the old saying? The smartest person in the room is a woman's intuition. So really finding out what the challenge is. I remember, a patient I, I met uh, 20 some years ago in New Jersey, where I initially started practicing, said, I think I have gluten problems. I'm reading about this gluten issue in this phenomenon called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So I heard about it from a patient who read an article and no one believed her. And I said, listen, I said, there may not be a test yet, but let's just stop and see how you feel. And I supported her and she did better. And then also that mind, body, and spirit are all interconnected. Uh, I love the saying when someone says, it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. I mean, do we really need a test to tell us that if somebody is emotionally spasmodic, they'll be vascularly spasmodic. You know, they'll have high stress hormones that they can't sleep. So I think it's very, very important. And then also appreciating relationships with yourself and others being a big component to health. So I kind of think of those tenets as integrative health and wellness medicine. And I recommend you think about those as you're working with healthcare providers, uh, with yourself or others and seeing, are they meeting my needs? Are they listening to me? Is it personalized? Uh, if not, can you get other perspectives and other opinions? I joke that uh, I used to be in large groups and I was kind of ostracized because I was taking too much time. And although I had really good outcomes, I wasn't meeting the needs of you know, the widgets that they wanted to, to see 30 patients a day. So when I left five, six years ago, I decided that I would also be available to consult. So half my practice is consulting people who have an internist and want another opinion and do fancy labs and half is just uh, taking care and helping them out. So how do I approach a patient and how should you think about your evaluation with physicians or the GP, family practice, doctor? The first thing I think about is, you know, what are vital signs? And I think about both the physical and the metaphysical, you know, the both of course, Greek words, physics meaning physical health. So under the physical vital signs, some of these you know very well, right? Blood pressure, heart rate, breaths per minute. But what about body composition? Waist circumference to height. Waist circumference over height is more important than just weight because you can have belly fat that's underappreciated in these BMI recordings looking at just height and weight. So waist circumference over height. Also body composition. I have a machine that does body fat and muscle mass analysis, so critical. Women don't appreciate if they're under muscle, they're gonna have problems with their bones and joints. Neurologists in uh, academic centers are looking at muscle mass correlating with cognitive decline. And if you have weak muscles, does it make the brain more difficult to work? And, and if I had to argue, and I, and I probably see more women than men because women are more interested in their health, even though I have a minor in stubborn men health, is that women don't strain their muscles enough. I have a lot of women who are under muscle, 
and they're not doing things to strain their muscles like weight bearing exercises on the upper body, lower body. So I think a lot of women who are quote unquote overweight it's because they're under muscle, uh, not over fat. So really, really important to do that. And I also measure grip strength. Grip strength correlates to cognitive health. Uh, it correlates to muscle strength. A lot of really good data on grip strength, if you were to look that up. So I look at that. And then on the metaphysical, I'm like, I want to know what the person is doing. I ask them tons of questions. They fill out questionnaires. I want to know their biography and their story, you know, where they're from, what their upbringing was, what their genetics are and heritage. There's a phenomenon called nutrigenomics, genetics and food interacting. So if you're from, you know, Northern European heritage, should you have some of the Baltic Sea or Nordic foods that your genetics grew up with for thousands of years versus myself in, in the Mediterranean? Versus maybe a person from the Far East has a hard time with cow's dairy. In this interconnectedness, of course, we're going to have foods from all over the world, but that can play a role. Also a timeline. I'm fascinated by how things developed over time. I remember meeting a young woman who, when I unrolled, un unraveled her history, she developed her health problems of anxiety and depression when she moved into a new house that was full of mold and her mother had passed away and her job was terrible and it was a perfect storm and no one had put it together in the timeline they just kind of looked for diagnoses and diseases and i said all these things happened at once that probably created your problems that were called irritable bowel or depression or anxiety so a timeline is important also triggers what are triggers food stressors environment really really important to to tease that out. Are there stressors? And then again, what their goals and thoughts are. I really think it's important to know what a person's state of the union is. So I think those are really, really important. And I, I read these studies over and over again that the average doctor gives a patient 20 seconds before they interrupt. So to me, you know, I'm asking these questions in a thorough, you know, forms, but then also just having them speak and tell their story. Because again, Intuitive health, so important to find out what's what's on their radar and their goals, which may be different than me and my goals. So then looking at uh, the next important step, I think, is looking at appropriate blood work. I call it the river of life. And I think too many doctors fall short in this. Um, you know, insurances will cover so many good tests, especially if you code it properly. So we're very well known for doing our comprehensive laboratories. And I always like to say, where is a person's biochemistry taking them? Many things are happening under the radar that are way before a disease or an illness. And we should look for optimal, not just normal. So I love ordering blood tests and seeing you know, what's happening. So I wanna kind of go over what are some of the important ones that I like to measure that anyone can get and should be asking for. Well, first is nutrient deficiencies. You know, Are you running on empty? What are your building blocks? What are the five, six or key nutrient deficiencies that I see commonly and are underappreciated? So in no particular order, omega-3 essential fats. The amount of omega-3 fats, and we'll talk about this with the Mediterranean diet, but it's so important. I always ask myself, does this person need an oil change? The amount of fat, of good and bad fats is critical to health. Um, and most people aren't checking that. Important for the heart health and brain health as well. Key minerals, magnesium and zinc are two of my favorite. You know, magnesium's involved in 300 reactions. It helps the brain, it calms the body down, it's good for blood pressure, it helps the bowels. So are you mineral deficient? A lot of medicines deplete magnesium. And then also zinc. There's the old saying, no zinc, no think. Zinc has gotten a lot of publicity now because of immune function and with COVID. Uh, the exciting news is that these mineral deficiencies and nutrient deficiencies are also helpful for COVID. Great research on omega-3 levels and fish oil helping COVID long as well. So magnesium and zinc, you can actually measure them. It's RBC magnesium and RBC zinc. Some doctors who do check it, check the wrong magnesium and the wrong zinc. So you should ask for an omega-3 profile, an RBC, which is red blood cell, RBC magnesium, RBC zinc. Um, and then of course, everyone knows about vitamin D, um, I, I tell my patients that when I came down here in 2004, the Quest rep said, you're the only doc, one of the few doctors I know who's ordering vitamin D on all your patients. And I said, yeah, the data has been around for a couple of years. And they said, no one's ordering it here. We love your business. I said, it's probably more of a hormone than a vitamin. And now we know, you know, with 
the flu seasons and COVID, that those are the highest levels. If your level is greater than 50, the chance of a cytokine storm and a COVID infection is less than 5%. So, so critical. And no one's talking about this, unfortunately. You know, they're talking about other things, but not about these lifestyle and about these nutrients. And then B vitamins. B vitamins critical for brain function, critical for mood, critical for heart health. Again, are they optimal? We can actually measure them. And then vitamin A and iodine were minerals that I always measured, really critical now for the immune system. So not just zinc, but iodine and vitamin A. Uh, most people are low on iodine because no one has salt anymore. And the other source, which is shellfish and, and sea vegetables and sushi, not a lot of folks eat. So a lot of common patterns I see is low omega-3s, low zinc, low iodine, uh, and they're really critical for the bone health in addition to vitamin D. So I, I think those are things that are easy to measure and no one is checking them. So I would recommend you ask for them. And then I look at, you know, hormones. So what are some of the key hormones, no matter what age we are? Well, to me, the first important hormone is insulin resistance, the hormone that stores fat that goes way up before diabetes. So there's companies like Quest and LabCorp have insulin resistance scores. You can measure your fasting insulin. If you're more interested, you can even do a glucose tolerance test. I still do my, a lot of patients. You don't have to be uh, you know, young and pregnant. A lot of patients have a good fasting blood test. And then I give them a sugar drink or tell them to eat a carb meal and check it. And all of a sudden their insulin spikes up, right? So insulin resistance, insulin markers, so critical. That's probably the most important hormone. And then the stress hormones, the adrenal hormones, there's a whole panel of adrenal tests. Cortisol is one, but DHEA and pregnenolone are another. So DHEA and pregnenolone with a P and cortisol are part of the adrenal profile uh, because so many patients, especially, you know, in this area, right, are under chronic stress, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I was telling Lynn that Lynn has seen it all here, but you know, this area I, in my 17 years has exploded, let alone in 20 or 30 years. And it's, you know, one of the things I joke about is, uh, you know, Lynn and I are from the same neck of the woods, at least up in New York and New Jersey you had alternative roads here. You don't have any. So there's always traffic. And again, this is BC before COVID. There's always traffic and infrastructure is poor in the DMV. So the amount of cortisol stress for a lot of people was very, very high. So some silver linings with, uh, with COVID. So measure insulin hormones, adrenal hormones, and then the thyroid profile. Most doctors do a, a simple thyroid. You should also include the free T3. T3, not just T4. So most doctors do TSH and T4, but T3 actually is the part of the thyroid profile that, that's the most active and gets into the cells. So a T3 could be low and no one knows it. And then measuring your antibodies, because if you have thyroid antibodies, it's a sign of autoimmune disease and would benefit from uh, different treatments. So the number one autoimmune disease in America is thyroid antibodies and no one's checking it, unfortunately. So really, really important. Uh, and then, you know, what to do with the sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Should we measure them on all patients? Measure them on women after menopause, perimenopause. Well, part of the challenge is, and no one ever told me this, uh, my wife is a former ICU nurse said, I didn't know that women's hormones can start changing in their late 30s. I started gaining weight in my 40s and no one told me. And I, I, then I, in her gynecologist that measured, I measured her estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and they were off. And, uh, you know, I think women, you know, last couple of years are getting their testosterone measured. Some of them are getting treated because it can help osteoporosis. I measure them on men and women. You know, I'm seeing epidemic proportion of young men with low testosterone. Uh, so it's really, really growing. But I also see women on the flip side is they're post-menopause, but they've gained weight and they still have high estrogen, which should be low. So I think measuring these hormones are important, uh, you know, for men and women. So hormones are, 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 are key as a building block and a stress buffer for life. And then I think about the concept that someone coined that I love to use, the four horsemen of aging. What are the four horsemen of aging? We can actually measure some of these metrics. So in no particular order, one metric is inflammation, right? So inflammation, we can actually measure that and there's a bunch of inflammation tests. 
the CRP is one, but now there's cardiac inflammation markers. So it's important. So inflammation is one horseman of aging. Another one is glucose control. We mentioned that is the blood sticky. Is there free radicals or oxidative stress? You can actually measure free radicals. The liver tests are also a sign of that. Iron, if iron is high and you have rusting, uh, it's a free radical in the body. So glucose control, inflammation, free radicals, and then just stress, which unmasks everything. So those are the four horsemen of aging. We can actually measure these markers. So if someone is feeling fine, if their inflammation is high or their glucose is high, they could have problems lurking around the corner. And then lastly, in the blood work, it's uh, these cardiovascular markers. So you should be asking for advanced cholesterol profiles that look at the size and the shape of the cholesterol, the omega-3, like we mentioned, the inflammation, like we mentioned. Also, looking at, there's some new blood tests that have been around for a while, but now they're being used in the outpatient that measure heart strain and then any inflammation on the heart muscle. And the new research shows that uh, you can look in the quartiles. If you're on the highest level of normal, maybe at higher risk than the lowest level. So I call it the happy heart test. It's called a BNP. B as in boy, N as in Nancy, P as in Peter. So BNP is a test that until a couple of years ago was only in the hospital to rule out heart failure. Now we can measure it in the office. I do it all the time because mildly increased BNP increases your risk for a lot of cardiac problems and predates a heart attack. And then troponin, T-R-O-P, troponin is a test initially used for heart attack. Now it's used in the outpatient setting to see if there's any heart muscle strain that predates heart attack. So really key metrics. Of course, other tests like liver and kidney function, most doctors do. You know, PSA, prostate test for men, a lot of doctors will do. Um, some Many are doing vitamin D, but I don't think many are doing enough. As my patients say, they're like, wow, it's like 20 page report here. Uh, there are more vials to be drawn, but as most of my patients know, it's just one stick and you just change the tubes, but it's still less blood than when you give to uh, the Red Cross. So really, really important. And, you know, I wanted to end that part of the talk before I move over to the Mediterranean diet, but saying that really, really key is we can actually measure these metrics in the river of life. You can have control over your destiny. You shouldn't settle for a doctor or healthcare provider who's not listening, doesn't look at you as an individual, who doesn't really want to understand interconnectedness, is not keeping tabs on are you isolated? Do you have vitality? Uh, so I think really, really important. And uh, there are a lot of good resources. I discuss that now. And again, I like the term personalized medicine. But I want to kind of finish the second part here briefly, just kind of give you my take on the Mediterranean diet and lifestyle. A lot of really good research is out there. And I think it'll, it'll speak to this, you know, really advanced group uh, who I think is, is, is deep thinking. So when I think of optimal health, people ask me, what are some of the terms I use or what, how I define it? I define it as, you know, having good nutrition, that often includes fasting. We can discuss that. Exercise and movement, since movement is medicine. Sleep and relaxation. Again, think of the siesta that most of us don't do here. Circadian rhythm, light and dark. We need sunlight. And a lot of people in COVID have not gotten sunlight. And now with technology, you're not getting darkness. So light and darkness for a circadian rhythm. Stress and resiliency, so overcoming adversity. So having stress and asking about resiliency, and then relationships and networks like the village that you all have. So really, really key is that, so that's kind of my overview of, you know, what real health is. I think a lot of traditional cultures have this. Um, I always mention food first. You know, people think about food as medicine, but food is also information. So food can turn on and off genes. There was a study that broccoli, for example, turned on all these detoxification genes and helped with DNA synthesis for example, or the olive oil that's so important for the brain health and heart health. So food is information. What information is it giving to you? And if it's a processed food, is it giving false information? And the problem with COVID is, uh, although people were not eating out as much, they were taking in, or as my British friends say, takeaway. So my patients were like, doc, I'm eating home. And I'm like, what's the source? And I said, I got it from a local store. And I said, that's great. I love supporting the Greek restaurants as well and all the other good places. We have to realize most of them have fake vegetable oils because it's cheaper. So what's your plan to handle that? For example, antioxidants and fish oil 
taken after a meal can block some of the effects of a vegetable oil. A post meal walk can help improve that, right? So, you know, we are not eating as well as we can. And uh, the research shows that in 1900, 2% of the meals were eating away from home. And now 50% are eaten away from home. And I'm sure during COVID, that's much more, right? I mean, no one is, some folks are cooking, but many are not. So it's kind of really balanced. Um, you probably heard of Michael Pollan is a famous uh, food writer who said, you know, famously, you know, in defense of food, everyone knows about his famous lines, like eat real food, not much, mostly from plants. We had a great discussion on one of his presentations about traditional diets versus modern diets. And I want to just kind of read what the traditional diet segment said. It said foods from fertile soil, organ meats over muscle meats, animal fats, animals on pasture, dairy products that were raw or fermented, grains and legumes that were soaked or fermented, bone broths, unrefined sweeteners like honey and maple syrup, fermented vegetables, fermented uh, beverages, unrefined salt, natural vitamins and foods, traditional modes of cooking. Um, and then he has a whole list of the opposite in modern diets. So I think traditional cultures really get this. So you want to ask yourself, what part of my diet has those in there? Historically speaking, you know, the Bible is a great place to look at the history of foods. You know, uh, the Old Testament in particular, 7th century BC, discussions about the seven superfoods. It's just fascinating. Barley, wheat, pomegranate, fig, grape, olive, and the honey date. Uh, the date, honey, but from a date. So those seven powerful foods, uh, studies have shown the fertile crescent used to have a lot of that. Now there's much less. It's a really, really powerful food. The Mediterranean triad, based on their poor uh, environment to grow foods and their infertile soil, was you know, the grape, the olive, and traditional grains, barley for the most part, and then wheat in the 70s and 80s. So I'll, uh, my wife is Lebanese, so we have similar interests in our culture and our food, but our kids, friends will all make fun of them because we'll give them like these barley rusks, like these baked grains of barley or rye, and their friends are like, we never have barley or rye. And I'm like, yeah, those are powerful grains, and most people are just eating wheat or maybe oatmeal. So those traditional foods, as uh, someone said, the Mediterranean diet is uh, different in different cultures. There's a great quote I like to say in 200 AD, a Roman senator said he was in the Danube near Vienna and he couldn't understand what they were eating. And he said, these inhabitants lead the most miserable existence of all mankind. They cultivate no olives and drink no wine. So I think it's really important to know what some of the culture tendencies are. Um, but the history of the Mediterranean diet is actually the history of the diet in Crete. So uh, not all parts of Greece are the same. Crete and Southern Italy are a little different than the rest of Italy and Greece. We think Crete took in the diet from the Middle East, Babylonians, the Israelis, the Egyptians. So, and it, and it kind of made it their own, but it was known for certain types of foods but then the rest of Greece took over. But post-World War II, Greece, the studies in the Mediterranean diet were done at Crete. And it looked at other parts of Greece that wasn't as good. It was more westernized, but not as healthy. But these diets, of course, had local food that were seasonal. Wild plants, a lot of wild plants, gardens of longevity in these plants, in a lot of these places, although no longer here, had omega-3 fats. So when you had a cheese, when you had... Uh, a wild game or you had a chicken, they actually had a lot of omega-3 in their bodies because they had these wild plants and these greens. Fresh fruit as dessert. Uh, the main starch was legumes and beans more than grains. Uh, protein were three vegetable proteins to one animal protein, so a lot of vegetable proteins. High omega-3s also from walnuts and fish as well as greens. Uh, the yogurt and the dairy was mostly cow, I'm sorry, it was mostly sheep and goat. I think of feta cheese. A lot of my patients have a hard time with dairy, but not with those. And olive oil was a primary fat, you know, averaging four to five tablespoons a day. So you look at the research on the Mediterranean diet when they ask a question, you know, are you engaging in the Mediterranean diet? One of the questions is, are you having four tablespoons at minimum of olive oil a day? 
not easy to do if you're not thinking about it. Cooking with it is not enough. They drenched their foods with the olive oil, so that was really important. And again, the grains had rye and barley as well, and much more than wheat. And when a, a Greek scientist in the 50s and 60s came to America and had a terrible experience with the American cheese and the food, she wanted to know what was so great about the Mediterranean diet and did research. And what was shown to be helpful were what she coined the term bioprotective nutrients. So these foods had nutrients in them that were protective to the biological system. Uh, and it was one, the amount of omega-3, two, the amount of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which we can do in those blood tests that I told you about that no one checks. And whereas in America, that ratio was 15 to one, in Greece, it was five to one. In Japan, it was five to one, right? So I have patients of mine who say they're eating well, and it's kind of like a confession. And I do their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and it's really off. And I'm like, I don't think you're eating well. So these cultures, and again, the island of Crete in Japan were very similar in their data, had really low omega-6, which is the inflammatory fat, and high omega-3. So the ratio was like five to one or less. Most of my patients were off their game. It's like 10 to one, 15 to one, 20 to one. And those ratios being higher linked to ADD and dementia and heart disease. So really, really important. Uh, so bioprotective nutrients, the omega-3s, and the amount of olive oil and olives in the diet, those nutrients are really, really important. And then also, they had a lot of other antioxidants from teas, coffee, and greens. So teas, wine, coffee. The coffee in Greece is a boiled coffee that's kind of like a French press, a lot more antioxidants than the American coffee. Interestingly enough, the number one source of antioxidants in the American diet is coffee. So but Greek coffee, um, wines, and there's good and bad about wine, but a lot of antioxidants, a lot of herbal teas. And there's some Greek mountain tea that has as much antioxidants as green tea. Uh, and then these wild greens. So a lot of antioxidants in the foods, the ingredients and in the olive oil, the omega-3 fats, really, really key. And the other component was that there was a lot of fasting. We could talk more about that, but fasting is really, really key. And it was culturally, religiously based. Um, and to this day, the monks and nuns who fast often have more health than, you know, those who are more westernized. And we all know that the benefits of fasting have been really improving, uh, or at least on the radar now. Uh, so to summarize the Mediterranean diet, it's is it a diet or a pattern of eating. You know, we want it realize it's embraced in many, many cultures, and that probably Southern Greece, uh, Greece, uh, Southern Italy, and Spain have probably the most robust experiences. Other parts of the Mediterranean may not be as successful, but blunt, abundant plant foods, a lot of healthy fat, fish is much more than a typical American diet, real good grains, the olive oil, of course, uh, and that there's periods of fasting. And when you look at the, at the uh, Mediterranean and Greek diet, there's more fasting in the Eastern Orthodox of Greece than of the Western Catholics of Spain, France, and Italy. And there's just more regimented fasting in that part of the Christian community. So my grandmother would fast 180 to 200 days a year based on the church calendar, but she was a vegetarian or a vegan. So feasting and fasting is really, really important. And you look at the research, the Mediterranean diet has a lot, has a very high compliance rate. So, it, you know, it tastes good and it's very important. Uh, now, this became much more prominent a way of approaching health with the blue zones. I don't know if you all have heard of that term, the blue zones, but it's got a lot of publicity when some scientists in 2008, 2007 said, there are some longevity hotspots and the scientists used a blue marker and they started circling them. And initially it was Okinawa in Japan and a place in Costa Rica and Loma Linda, California, and then Sardinia. And they started looking and seeing what are things that are similar and there were a lot of similarities. There were some differences. You know, some cultures had soy and some didn't. Some had different legumes. But most of them had family networks and connections like friends and villages. Ate real food, had a lot of movement, had social engagement. They all had a lot of beans uh, and they all were physically active. So that was an interesting combination. And then some had less time to urgency than others. 
Some had more wine than others. You know, those in Loma Linda, the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, they didn't have wine, uh, but other cultures did. So there was very, very interesting saying, you know, these things have similarities. Can we list them? And then in 2011, the Greek island of Ikaria, which is different than Crete, closer to Turkey, research showed that they had the highest amount of 90-year-olds in Europe, in the world. And New York Times Magazine did an article said, you know, the island where people forget to die. So they added it in to the uh, blue zones and they found some other things, you know. So they said, look, you know, part of the things that they have is very isolated. So, you know, isolated from Western society, Crete became very Westernized. These guys retained their traditions. Uh, self reliancy really no attention to time. You know, I like the joke, they don't pay their taxes. And a lot of Greeks don't. That probably plays a role also. They didn't sweat the small stuff. As a culture, not interested in wealth. And it's very interesting. You know, the smarter, more wealthy people are, often the, the less healthy they are. They happen to have beans six times a week. They had more fish than other Greek islands. A lot of barley and rye. They happen to have potatoes more than other parts of Greece, but still can be healthy. And they had more gardens of longevity and wild greens in other parts of Greece, which is very, very interesting. They had coffee and wine daily. And they had a lot of mineral baths. So very, very interesting. You know, a little bit more self-reliant, a little less off the beaten path. Some of the same foods, some different foods. I think not sweating the small stuff was probably a reason why they didn't do as well, did, did as well. Uh, and as Epicurus said, the famous philosopher, we should look for someone to eat and drink with before looking for something to eat and drink. And I think that really uh, is true with that, that island culture. But also uh, fitness plays such a huge role and movement is medicine. There's a famous quote by Socrates who actually served in the Greek army and like Plato were very athletic in the Greek gymnasium. Socrates says, no citizen has a right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. What a disgrace it is for a man to grow old without ever seeing the beauty and strength which the body is capable of. So very, very Jack LaLanne-esque. And when I started getting into health, I started studying Jack LaLanne. And this kind of reminds me, someone who 50 years ago was juicing and talking about his relationship with his wife and exercising and taking his vitamins. So a really, really interesting perspective. And you look at these cultures, they're optimistic as well, and they have a lot of movement, and they set out a special time to relax the mind and body. And I think more importantly, they have healing spaces, you know, to get away off the beaten path. Um, it, so when I tell people and I, and I give lectures, sometimes formally with slides, I put up a slide about uh, a psychologist who's Greek-American, and he got saved by studying ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Pythagoras. And his book was called How Plato and Pythagoras Can Save Your Life. And basically, he was a New Yorker who went off the beaten path, got involved with drugs and alcohol, was on life support, turned his life around, studying transpersonal psychology. And he said, when I studied these Greeks, I found out that they had certain things that tuned him into health. They had a strict diet with a lot of fasting, rigorous physical exercise and movement every day, daily meditational walks, had lessons regularly on ethics and character. So virtuous, virtues were on their horizon and they regularly contemplated things like music and philosophy and the heavens and religion and math. So because those things help tune their health. And I thought that was very, very interesting. How do you tune, tune the health? So, you know, just kind of in summarizing is when I look at cultures in modern health versus traditional health, uh, I try to tell myself, you know, is this person or am I engaged too much in, in modernity, which is full of complicated lives with small daily insults. As my relatives say, you know, you guys really have a lot of daily insults the emails, the tasks, uh, looking at technology, worrying about things that we often don't. Realizing not only is the food and environment cult is toxic, but also the culture is toxic, right? Just a lot of stress in the culture. Modernity has a high confidence in science, 
which isn't always the case, you know, think of COVID, um, they downplay faith and religion. The famous uh, philosopher and, and religious writer, Houston Smith, said there's really no more, there's very much, not much signs of the sacred state in modern societies. They're psychologically and physically very fragile, lack of adversity. Uh, think of the book, um, The Road Less Traveled, you know, back in the 70s, talking about neuroses. In the first paragraph said, life is difficult. And whether it's Buddhist or monotheist, monotheistic faiths, very, very common that culture and that society understood that in overcoming adversity and the hero's journey is not as much uh, common in this society. And there's a lot of isolation in the midst of abundance and that there's more interest in knowledge over character. Whereas in traditional society, especially with the ancient Greeks in the gymnasium and some of the modern Greek isolated islands, they had a wisdom of culture over the prestige of science. There were healing spaces. Think of the Asclepian temple in the modern spa. There was aesthetic discipline, right? So really silent simplicity and solitude, contemplating, looking at holistic environment rather than the parts, looking at isolation. So there's uh, abundance and isolation. Uh, abundance, I mean, isolation, but in abundance, right? So we're, we're isolated, but with a village uh, rather than uniquely by itself. And then also they live simply. You know, it was really a lot of periods of silent simplicity and solitude and that they believed in character and ethics, and that can still be the case. So it reminds me of, in closing, you know, there was a really interesting uh, survey saying, here's a questionnaire of eight things that are associated with longevity. And what are they and what are we doing? So the National Institute of Aging had a survey saying, these eight things are associated with aging. And the more you have them, the better. Moving daily for 45 minutes, at least seven hours of sleep, five days a week, three vegetable servings a day, having at least three friends that you like, that you can call on a bad day and will listen to you with a meaningful conversation. Belonging to a faith-based organization, a community, and showing up three to four times a month. Not smoking in the last five years. Uh, not having any unprotected sex with a stranger which is very interesting. And then believing that you have health and the ability uh, to be vibrant and live to 90. You know, so those are eight questions. If someone had two of them only, the average age in man was 68 and a woman 71. If you had five, it was 79 and 83. If you have seven out of eight, 88 years old, the average men lived and 92, the average woman lived. So it's very, very interesting. Three vegetables, not the fruits, which is intriguing. A lot of movement, having friends, so I think, I think your community embodies a lot of this in the traditional cultures that we talked about. Uh, so I'm very impressed with what you all are doing. And I think you can ask yourselves, can I continue to be in a traditional culture, but also have high tech and high touch, take advantage of modern medicine and, and get more data, but also practice a Mediterranean lifestyle. So why don't I close with that since it's been a little while and then take any questions you guys have on this or any other uh, similar topics. Thank you very much. That was really very interesting. And you certainly covered the gambit. My goodness, you covered an awful lot in that short amount of time. Uh, it, it may have seemed to you like a long time, but it really went quickly and it was very interesting. Uh, we are going to open up to questions. And before we do, uh, I'm gonna take the liberty of asking the first one. I know you mentioned um, fasting. And I've seen an awful lot on social media lately about that and recently told my daughter I didn't think intermittent fasting was healthy. So other than telling me I'm wrong, what else can you say about that? Well, I never argue with a woman from Brooklyn. So, you know, I think it's interesting. I think you're, you're, you're partially right because fasting can incorporate caloric restriction versus meal timing. So I think everyone's got into this meal timing and just say I'm going to eat eight hours a day. And in my experience, it often doesn't work well for women and more likely to help an obese diabetic man than a woman, but caloric restriction may be a better tool. So part of the Greek way of fasting was a couple of days a week, they would eat less. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only the foods they ate, but the amounts they ate. There's a diet called the 
Oh, what Let me see here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. So there's a diet called the five, two diet, which says two days a week, non consecutively, we're not going to eat a lot of calories. We're going to eat half of our normal calories. So two days a week, eating half your normal calories. Other people say like every other day, I'm going to eat less calories. Another way of looking at it is saying, what's my weight Add a zero. So if you're 150 pounds, 1500 calories, let me eat less than that. So that should be your ceiling. So I think caloric restriction and less calories um, is probably better for many women. Some will do intermittent fast. Uh, there's also other kind of fasts out there. There's a company that has a five day fast where you have these food meal plans for five days. That's been shown to be helpful. But I think you're right, Lynn. I think that a lot of people have gotten into this intermittent fast and craze. And in my experience, a lot of women without protein in the morning just don't do as well. Thank you. Um, I will now open it up to everybody else. If anybody has a question, um, feel free to unmute yourself and I will be happy to recognize you. So it's not a free for all, but you are welcome to ask questions. Emily, I see you're unmuted. So I'm gonna ask Emily who's up to arrange these programs. Hi, Emily, how are you? Good, thank you. And thank you very much for a fascinating program with a lot of good information that you know, I'd, like to, I'd like to start to practice. Oh, and I'm wonderful. wondering, how would you suggest someone begin um, and what would be the most important changes to try to make in, in a you know, Western lifestyle that would be helpful for your health? Well, I, I think uh, I would begin as, you know, as Socrates said, first know thyself. So I'd kind of get a sense of where are you and ask yourself and say, you know, where am I compared to 20, 30 years ago? Uh, you know, the, the presumption that we should gain weight and feel sick as we age so I would say is, am I feeling vital? Uh, you know, what are my goals? And write them down. And then start tracking things. I would track what you eat. I think it's a powerful tool. Track your movement. Under movement, say, am I also not just moving? Am I straining my muscles? Am I moving my, mu am I moving my body? Am I straining my muscles? And am I flexible? What's my sleep? A lot of research say that Sleep is almost always, always predates other physical and emotional health issues. Mm. Um, and what's my energy level like, especially or maybe without caffeine? Mm. There is, uh, I think caffeine could be good. I like to call it black soup, uh, you know, taking a word from the uh, frontiersmen in the 1800s in America where they would have their black soup in the morning to get them going. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, if you're having a day and you can't function without coffee, then maybe your energy reserves are not good. Maybe your sleep isn't good. A lot of my patients say they're healthy, but they'll have coffee every morning and wine every night. Coffee to get them going and wine to get them down. And when I do a kind of a fast on some of these things, it's worse than uh, anything else. So I, th I think asking yourself what your energy is, what your sleep is, uh, you know, what your fitness is and tracking your foods is very, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? I'm going to go to gallery review so I can see people. Does anybody have any other questions? We have this fabulous expert here. Let's not waste the opportunity. Um, please unmute yourself or raise your hand so I can see if you have any questions. Well, I'm going to ask. I'll, I'll ask one more if I might. Okay, when, when you're done, I see Andre's iPad also has a question, so I'll ask you to unmute yourself and go second. Okay, Emily, you're next. Um, do you advise taking um, supplements uh, as a way to get some of the minerals and vitamins you were talking about? Or do you only believe that food, uh, various foods are a good source? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Emily. Um, yeah, I, I think vitamins play a, a critical role. And I use Jack Lane as an example. You know, he juiced, he worked out. He was able to uh, do more pull-ups than a young Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1970s. They took a ton of vitamins too. So I, I think a lot of the health and wellness world, I call it the Gwyneth Paltrow approach, is to take 20 vitamins and wing it. I think it's a great secondary backup plan, uh, especially to fill in the gaps. 
So mm -hmm. I think, you know, the lifestyles first, but, you know, hard to get enough salmon, uh, omega-3 with just salmon. So I think fish oil can be very helpful. Vitamin D, hard to get enough sun in Northern Virginia, DC, Maryland. And we know we often need higher levels for COVID, for example. And as I said, a level greater than 50 protects you for a cytokine storm. So I think some of the minerals, like I know, like I studied a lot with athletes and athletes, not unlike a lot of us, when they're overstressed, they were depleted and they were taking things like a lot of magnesium, I would see uh, probiotics rather than just cultured foods. If their gut wasn't healthy, um, things like turmeric and ginger, a lot of research that these supplements may be even better than the foods. So I think the nutraceutical world is exploding with a lot of these tools to be helpful. So I do, I consider them an important part, but really secondary, I think, some patients, you know, have a whole bag of vitamins and never exercise, mm -hmm. um, they never walk, you know, that, sir, that, that questionnaire, you know, 45 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of patients who are retired and taking all this calcium for their bones, which is questionable if it's enough by itself, but never walk and, and never mm -hmm. strain their muscles. So a good point, I think important, but, you know, secondary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we did have another question. Andres, yes. I don't know. Yes. Hi, my name is Elisa. And I have, first of all, I want to thank you for a very informative presentation. And I wanted You're to welcome. inquire if you still practice. And if you do, uh, if you're able to evaluate uh, vitamin intake and blood test results. I'm yeah. very active. I eat a very healthy diet. Uh, I've been an athlete all my life, but I've uh, been taking Dr. Mercola's vitamin for a long time. And yeah. I just take things that I believe that are good, but I really don't know if I'm taking the right ones and right. the right amount. So yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah, actually I'm still in practice. You know, I've been the last five, six years, you know, my office is in Tyson's corner in Northern Virginia. And I have clients all over. And actually, six years ago, when I started, I did telemedicine. So I was one of the first doctors to do that. And we still do it. So we have clients all over. Uh, obviously, in person is always more fun to get some of the metrics. But we have patients all over. And between Quest and LabCorp, people can get lab tests anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to personalize that based on their needs. you know. But yeah, so we still work with patients. We do a lot of consultations. I never want to step on the relationship between a patient and their doctor, but I appreciate that many people want to know more. Mm -hmm. So you want to email us and, and, and let me get you the information. Anybody has any questions in general, they can always email us and my team after it, if they have any other things that popped up, but for sure, be happy to help out. And, and we work with a lot of people uh, all over. Thank you very much. I'll be seeing you shortly. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Well, if not, it's almost 630 and we know kind of 60 minutes is about as long as anyone <laughs> wants to share it, stare at a television screen or computer <laughs> screen. Yes. Do you want to um, put your I, email in the, in the chat? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, good idea. Thank you, Linda. Yes. Um, Dr. Pappas, would you mind uh, putting your email address? In Absolutely. Let me see if I can, if I can handle this. Uh, yeah. Okay, if not, I can send it out um, afterwards. No, I think um, uh, yeah, Pappas Health 2016 at Gmail. There you go. Okay. Um, and I want to invite everyone on our next uh, CCC program, Cocktails, Conversation, and Community, will be on May 19th when Leo Waring will be talking about the history of his family business during Washington's years of prohibition and bootlegging. So um, his family, yes, and Dr. Pappas, you're welcome to join us for this. It sounds well, like a thank really you very much. presentation. Um, he's written a book about his family history and he lives in Foggy Bottom. So he's a neighbor and we look forward to hearing about it and about his family and their very interesting history. So he's seen it all, not as much as I have, <laughs> or I should say much more than I have, but he's certainly seen it all. and. He's a native Washingtonian and he can share quite an interesting family history. Dr. Pappas, again, thank you so very much. This was My a pleasure. very you, interesting presentation. We um, 
appreciate your time and your efforts and your energy and certainly what you're doing for the uh, community as a whole. It really is a wonderful service and we are fortunate that you were able to share some of us it with us this evening. So thank, thank you so you much for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. Take thank care. You thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Stay well, everyone. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.